welcome everyone attending both in person. Uh, you, we're, I'm going to be switching back and forth between uh, this video of me as the kind of host of this event. My name is Connor Fitzpatrick. I'm the in-house education chair for WISE. And I'll be switching back and forth between my own camera and the uh, hybrid camera for the hybrid viewing. Everybody can wave and say hi. <laughs> um, so we decided a little last minute to make this a hybrid meeting. So um, we're going to be doing that throughout the day. Uh, but I'd like to thank everyone both in person and at home for tuning in. Um, it means a lot to, to see so much support for uh, WISE and this in-house education retreat, which is now in our fourth year, um, which we are very proud to uh, be continuing this tradition of hosting a one-day symposium uh, with invited speakers and trainee speakers to discuss issues of gender disparity focused on data-driven information to arm ourselves with data-driven uh, knowledge to uh, be more aware of issues in gender disparity and uh, uh, greater issues. Um, today I'm welcomed by my five co-panelists, uh, Nicole Sivitz, Catherine Denny, and Marie Dussault, uh, Dussault are all uh, students at the lab, uh, all fourth year students, um, graduate students, and they're going to be presenting on various topics. And I'm also very delighted to be welcoming uh, Dr. Banu Subramaniam, um, and Dr. Jeanette Abate as our keynote speakers for the day. Uh, the schedule, uh, of course, was sent out to everyone, but we'll be running from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, with a lunch break from 11.40 to 12.40. For those that are here, uh, we have catered Panera bread, uh, and then we'll also have a coffee break from 1.40 to 1.55. So it's a bit of a jam-packed you know, five-hour day, but we'll get uh, into the presentations in just a moment. And again, I'd just like to thank everyone for tuning in and joining for this in-house education retreat. And uh, also uh, throughout the talks, uh, if you have any questions for the speakers, please enter them into the Q&A box. And at the end of the, the talk, we will read those off to the panelists and um, they'll answer them. So. The trainee speakers will have about 25 minutes to, to present their presentations and then five minutes for questions. And the keynote speakers will have about 10 minutes for questions at the end of a 50 minute presentation. So just keep those numbers in mind. And uh, without any further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand over the podium to our first keynote or first speaker, uh, Kat Denny. Um, she is a fourth year graduate student from Stony Brook University in Jessica Tolkien's lab. And she's gonna be discussing mental health issues facing uh, gender minorities in STEM. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Kat Denny. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in neuroscience at Stony Brook University. Um, and as Connor said, I am completing my dissertation research in the lab of Dr. Jessica Tolkien. Um, I am the uh, Cold Spring Harbor Wise Chair of Mental Health. Um, and as such, I'm excited to talk to you about two of my favorite topics in science, gender and mental health. Um, specifically, I aim to discuss um, some mental health issues that face gender minorities in general, as well as in academia and STEM. So uh, today, uh, a quick outline of my talk. First, I will talk about the use of the term sex and gender in biology. Um, as someone who often studies sex differences in animal, animal models of behavior, this distinction is very important in context for talking about mental illness and well-being. Um, next, I will talk about how different factors of what we call biological sex have been uh, shown to impact mental health. Um, I will consider who gets left out of conversations and studies of mental health and gender diversity, particularly in STEM. And finally, for the last portion of the talk, I will discuss what factors affect the mental health of trans and non-binary people that are not included in studies of cisgender people. And finally, what we can do to improve basic science research on mental health issues in gender minorities. 
Um, so first, what's an agenda? Uh, the, the title of my talk is, is Mental Health Issues Facing Gender Minorities in STEM. So what is a gender minority? Um, this uh, pretty widely circulated image is called the gender bred person um, and kind of uh, shows four different levels of what we can call gender. Um, so you have your gender identity, which is how you in your head think about yourself. Um, it um, varies from I am a woman to I am genderqueer or non-binary um, to I am a man. Um, and this is again, your internal sense of, of who you are, um, which can either correlate or vary from uh, gender expression, um, which can range from feminine to androgynous to masculine. Um, and it's kind of how you demonstrate your gender to the world um, based on traditional gender roles through the ways that you act, dress, behave, and interact with other people. Um, Biological sex is actually a bit more complicated than a linear um, spectrum from female to intersex to male, um, but I will get into that in the next slide. Um, and then also in gender, the gender bred person, we also include sexual orientation, which I'm not going to talk about in the talk today. Um, sex, like gender, gender is composed of multiple levels, um, so is sex. Um, sex is not a binary characteristic, although in science it is often treated as such. Um, factors in biological sex exist on a spectrum of variation, as do most traits. Um, so you can have chromosomal sex, where most people fall, fall into either XX or XY, but you can also have different genotypes, um, karyotypes, including um, XO, XXY, XYY, um, and other uh, variations on this as well. Um, some people are also, um, some intersex people are also chimeric, uh, meaning that different cells in their body have different uh, chromosomal sexes. Um, another factor of sex, of biological sex is gonadosteroid hormone balance. So this is the balance of androgens, estrogens, and progestogens um, in your body, which is one of the main things that um, the Tolkien lab studies. Um, you also have your primary sexual characteristics, which include like internal and external genitalia, um, which again come in many, many different variations um, and not, are not always easily detectable. Um, finally, we have secondary sexual characteristics, which include breast tissue, facial and body hair, hip width, um, and other traits. Um, and again, these traits all vary naturally. They don't always correlate with one another within an individual, and most can be altered by gender-affirming treatments. Um, there's a popularly cited estimate uh, by Anne Fosso Sterling, um, who um, has written extensively about what she calls the five genders. Um, and this, es this estimate is that about 1.7% uh, of the world population is intersex, uh, meaning that um, their sexual characteristics do not all align with female or male, um, but are some kind of in between. Um, this estimate does include some conditions that are not commonly described as intersex, um, such as Kleinfeld uh, syndrome and chimerism. Um, sorry, the lights in the red just went off. Um, the simplification of biological sex into a binary rather than a bimodal characteristic, as well as its conflation with gender, complicate basic science research on gender differences in mental health. Um, so what do we know about how biological sex impacts mental health? Well, we know that um, when we look at demographic data in psychiatric and neurological conditions, there are some biases in the rate of diagnosis. Uh, for example, women are about twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with a mood disorder, um, such as anxiety, depression, or bipolar, um, while men are about four times as likely to have an autism diagnosis. Um, and you can see that there's kind of a spectrum from large female bias to slight female bias um, to large male bias um, in all of these neurological and psychiatric conditions. Um, while we do have evidence of these phenomena being influenced by sex variable biology, such as hormone levels, 
Um, some of the differences also occur from a historical lack of inclusion in, of female subjects in biomedical research, um, leading to, for example, diagnostic criteria for autism that do not necessarily match the way that autism presents in female patients. Um, when we study sex differences, neuroendocrinologists like myself often assert that it is gonadal hormones like testosterone and estrogen that regulate sex variable biology. When these are altered by gender affirming surgeries and hormone treatments, um, we don't really know if the susceptibility of these patients to psychiatric and neurological conditions change um, because the evidence is limited there, but it is growing. Um, so we do have some evidence for hormone-based differences in mental health. Um, for example, um, gender affirming hormone therapy in transgender individuals can alter um, measures of, uh, of the brain's function, including um, neuronal activation um, measured through fMRI, brain structure uh, measured through structural MRI, and cognitive performance measured through a battery of tests. Um, gonadal hormones have also been shown to alter basal activity and reactivity of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is a main driver of physiological stress response associated with depression and anxiety. Um, and this is a main focus of my thesis work, so I'm totally happy to talk about that. Um, but um, other evidence has also shown that gonadal hormones impact um, other psychiatric and neurological conditions, including um, park, the development of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and cognitive decline symptoms, particularly in aging populations. Um, so th this is just a little bit about how factors of biological sex can, can influence mental health. Um, but we also have um, some evidence that gender, the kind of societal factors um, also impact mental health. So um, for example, stereotype threat um, definitely affects the mental health of women in academia. Um, stereotype threat is um, when an acute awareness of a stereotype leads to fear of conforming to that stereotype. Um, and this has been measured to uh, hurt performance of members of a social group. For example, um, if uh, there, there have been probably 300 studies, I think, um, from, from this source that was as of 2012, um, if studies showing that if, for example, um, you give um, men and women a math test um, and in some of the population you, you reinforce the gender, gender stereotype that men are better than women at math, um, the females will perform, the, the women will perform worse in the condition where they are made acutely aware of the stereotype, um, but will perform about equally when they are not acutely aware of the stereotype. Um, and stereotype threat um, leads to changes in mental health, including stress, um, negative mood, um, including anxiety, frustration, disappointment, and sadness. Um, increased monitoring of behavior, of your own self, your own behavior, um, greater emotional regulation, which is not always a good thing, um, and a reduction in mental capacity, um, as well as a decrease in motivation. Um, so um, we, we, do, we do have some evidence like this um, that, um, that gen gender identity and internal factors, um, such a, as thinking about stereotypes, um, can influence mental health. Um, but it's important to also consider who is missing from these studies. Um, so just as an example, um, I am about to show some data from the recently published HHMI um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiative. Um, and uh, we can see that even in inclusion initiatives, um, there is a population that is missing. And that is that you have gender listed as female and male, right? In, the, in leadership, in lab heads, in investigator lab staff, 
Um, and the, the third option here that it makes up 0.6% of the total um, employees in the investigator lab staff um, is listed as choose not to disclose. So in this um, survey design, the three options that were given for gender were male, female, and choose not to disclose. So missing from that um, are transgender individuals for whom um, female and male do not fit um, exclusively into that binary um, and non-binary individuals um, who also don't obviously don't fit into that binary. Um, and it's hard to even give an estimate um, for how many of these gender minorities are in STEM initiatives for, or in STEM institutions like HHMI um, because the data just isn't there. The, the, the survey design is such that um, they're just not included. And this is so common that, you know, like bad or exclusive gender demographic questions and options can be found all over social media. Um, like, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, the, so the identities of scientists supported by a large government, public and private institutions themselves are unclear because the data is not actually collected correctly. Um, but despite, you know, the, the limitations of the evidence available, and um, we can talk about what factors impact mental health of trans and non-binary people in STEM. Um, so there, is, there are a lot of societal factors, both in and outside of STEM, um, that impact the mental health of trans and non-binary people. Um, for example, um, kind of the, the very clear answer is, is um, evidence of transphobia, microaggressions, and discrim like blatant discrimination against trans and non-binary people. Um, rejection by family and other loved ones leading to a lack of a social support system. Um, the very real threat of violence for expressing one's identity. Um, and even as recent as um, within the past month, there was an article published in the B in, by uh, the BBC company um, by a cis woman calling for um, actual violence against trans women. Um, and this includes other gender-based violence that is not exclusive to um, trans and non-binary people, including domestic violence, harassment, and assault, um, as well as job insecurity and facing unconscious bias in hiring practices. Um, there are a few internal factors um, that also can impact mental health, um, which stem from ultimately the societal factors. So, for example, a lack of access to gender affirming health care like surgeries, hormones, um, therapy, etc., can lead to an experience called dysphoria, where the internal sense of gender does not match external factors. And this can be um, a really damaging experience. Um, again, the results of societal factors can be found in suicidal ideation and other mental health phenomena that are higher in trans and non-binary people than cisgender individuals. And these have been shown to be reduced with gender affirming care. So finally, I would like to say um, just a little bit about how do we improve the science on sex and gender differences in mental health and widely in biology. Um, really one easy, relatively easy way um, is to account for variation beyond the binary. And there's this really nice uh, neuroscience review um, by Daphne Joel published this year um, that called for um, moving from a binary framework where you have, again, genotype, um, primary sex characteristics, um, like um, internal and external genitalia, um, leading to, for example, um, coding things as a male or a female brain. Um, we can take these, some evidence from, from animals about components of biological sex or gender, animals don't really have gender, um, 
but we, we can take things like looking at genotype and looking at the effects of hormones isolated and dissociated from one another um, to show that sex effects on the brain can be opposite under different conditions and sex effects actually mix in individual brains. Um, so she proposes or um, reintroduces the mosaic hypothesis where we can see that brains from women and brains from men are composed of different, are, are, include different compositions um, of what we can call um, sex differences. Um, ultimately also, if you are doing social science work or biology that includes self-reports of gender and or sex, include options because not everybody falls neatly into a binary of gender or sex. Um, again, almost 2% of the world's population, according to a popular estimate, um, is intersex and um, that is about the same, I believe, as the number of people in the world who have red hair. So it's not as rare as you might think. Um, furthermore, um, when you're doing science that looks at sex differences, make sure that your statistics are being run properly. Um, so there have been pretty serious reports of statistical errors leading to misreporting of spurious sex differences. Um, so make sure that you're using appropriate measures for multiple comparisons, for example, in gene expression data, comparing sexes. Make sure your statistics are actually testing what you wanna test. If you think there's a difference in response to a treatment between sexes, you need to actually statistically test for an interaction between sex and treatment effects. And I have some references here, which I will share upon request um, from some recent publications examining this problem. So I know I'm wrapping up a little bit early, um, but in summary, um, Sex and gender are not interchangeable and neither one of them is binary. Um, factors of both sex and gender can impact mental health. Um, trans and non-binary people are often left out of studies in, of gender and mental health for simplicity, but you know, the world as it exists is not always simple. Um, use appropriate methods to increase inclusivity and improve basic science and sex differences. And here are some references. And I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. And I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of a discussion about what I presented. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kat. That was a really interesting and great presentation. Oh, I think you can maybe hear the clapping in the room. <laughs> it's tricky because I got to flip the mic back from facing me and then facing the room. But, um, yeah, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Does anybody in the crowd have a question that they want to ask now or? Okay, I, I actually have a question. So, I mean, this is kind of um, a generic question, but you know, one of the things that strikes me is that, or I guess it doesn't strike me too much, but um, the fact that these surveys, of course, are, are exclusively still entirely operating under the gender binary spectrum. Um, and so what do you think that we sort of maybe like as CSHLYs or as, you know, just trainees, local folks, small folks, like can ac actively do to, to kind of change that in any way, maybe at a local level, maybe building up to a larger level? Yeah, um, so I will say locally, um, the um, example that comes immediately to my head is when signing up for a COVID test on campus, um, gender options are male and female and that's it. Um, so maybe um, promoting other options, like for myself as a non-binary individual, I often like, like sure my gender expression is like 
very feminine and I was assigned female at birth. So I just go with like the simplest answer, but really, again, it's about the fact that like biology is complicated um, and, and society is complicated. Um, and just, I guess, reiterating that, like, for example, like my pronouns are in my, my Zoom thing. Um, uh, one thing that cisgender allies can do um, is to make that the norm, right? Make, make um, intro like when you introduce yourself to a new person, like, hi, my name is Kat, my pronouns are they, she, um, using, using neo pronouns and they pronouns for people who use them, um, just, just kind of normalizing um, differences in gender and, and sex. I think it is important for for changing, you know, the conversation and the the way that we collect that data as well. Um, looks like Nicole has her hand up. Yeah, I'll uh, turn the microphone to the room and then switch the webcam. If you want to try to ask your question, uh, just try to speak a little loudly. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Kind of. You got to speak up. Yeah, sorry. Put the light went off again. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I wanted to hear your opinion about something that um, I was thinking about as I was preparing for the talk that I'm going to give later. Uh, one of the papers that I talk about, there's this issue of assuming when you're looking like doing retrospective studies on uh, papers that have been published uh, there's this problem where if you assume the gender um, of the sign of the authors uh, based on the, the sex the predicted sex of the names and so i'm just i want to hear your thoughts on how can like uh like work on this issue of like um trying to look at gender differences um, in scientific literature, like studies that are like this. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I have a couple thoughts. Um, one is that it's, it's really hard to go back to a time when, you know, being out as a gender minority was really not acceptable. Um, and um, again, like, like some, sometimes there, there are assumptions that, that get made in analyzing previous literature. And, um, one thing that I think is changing slightly is that some journals are asking for, um, demographic information. Um, for example, um, not like a full diversity statement in, submitting a paper, but including um, things like ethnicity, gender, et cetera, um, that actually gets published along with, I can't remember the name of the, the specific journal I remember reading about doing this, um, but um, collect, collecting that data about the authors um, is definitely increasing um, as well as um, um, I can I can think of the Journal of Comparative Endocrinology actually recently um, put out a call for submissions for a um, a kind of impact of COVID um, special issue um, where they are specifically soliciting articles from people who identify as women. Um, people who are primary caregivers of children um, and people who have otherwise been adversely impacted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think co collecting that, inf that information and specifically promoting the contributions of um, people in minority status of some, in some way um, is really important moving forward. I hope that answered your question. Uh, certain journals collecting demographic information about the authors. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of difficult also because like by providing demographic information, depending on what the demographic information is, you 
can also open yourself up to discrimination. And that is kind of not good, not good. Um, but um, I think I think being like being clear about that is actually important for collecting kind of the metadata of um, the, the metadata of um, you know who's who is writing these articles, who is contributing. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, do the journals let you select more than male or female gender care categories? Um, of the ones that I have interacted with, um, like maybe a few do, but most do not. Yeah, and I, I think even, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I think even like, like cell press, like some of their sub journals do and some of them don't where they could sort of maybe more easily make it a, like a, a cell pan, you know, just policy rather than, than letting each journal decide whether or not to, but I don't know the politics behind that. But um, yeah, I had an, another quick question is, is, again, like more practically on our level, do you think that it would be something that we should advocate for as CSHL wise for like our own campus surveys? Because as you said, like our campus surveys themselves, you know, only have male or female, maybe it's something we could personally bring up and, and try to yeah. start at like a local level. Yeah, I think I think that's a good idea. Um, I mean, it it's something that, like, I as a non-binary person on campus have have definitely thought about. Um, but there's there's definitely you know work to be done on campus that we could we could start about start talking about doing. Yeah. Um, is there any more questions in the room? It doesn't look like anyone has a hand up. I, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat. So uh, we can wrap this up uh, now and switch over to uh, Dr. Banu.